In this lesson, we're going to learn to sketch the molecular orbitals for pi systems. This is important because there's some reactions in organic chemistry that don't really have a clear electrophile and nucleophile, but they proceed anyway. Let's look at the Diels-Alder reaction. In this reaction, a butadiene will react with an alkene to produce a cyclohexene when heated up. Now, this is a bit of a tough reaction here. This doesn't proceed very readily. Ethylene is a gas. We need to do this in a sealed tube. We need to heat it to about 200 degrees. It's actually better if these compounds are substituted. And when this butadiene has electron donating groups on it, and this alkene has electron withdrawing groups on it, the reaction proceeds more readily. The details of that are best left for another lesson, but what I want to show you is how we can push arrows for this transformation. Now, you should notice we don't have a clear electrophile and nucleophile. We're looking at some fairly nonpolar molecules, but we get these new bonds to form. And so we can show our conventional arrow pushing. Remember, that's just a tool to keep track of where the electrons form the bonds. And so we could show the alkene forming a new bond here. These electrons are going to shift over to make our double bond. And finally, these electrons will complete this circular flow of electrons to form the new bond here. Now, imagine we want to react two molecules of an alkene in a similar fashion. This reaction is called a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. And now if we imagine two molecules of ethylene reacting in a similar fashion, we might imagine we can do arrow pushing like this to form a cyclobutane. And for consistency, let's imagine we're heating up this reaction mixture as we did over here. Now, heating up a reaction can be called thermal conditions. And though we'll find that the Diels-Alder can proceed under thermal conditions, this 2 plus 2 cycloaddition will not proceed. So even though we could draw arrows here, this reaction doesn't proceed. And to understand why, we need to look at the molecular orbitals. So let's learn how to sketch them. We'll begin by looking at the molecular orbitals for ethylene. We'll draw an energy diagram. Now notice this reaction is a rearrangement of double bonds. So for this example, we really need to look at the p orbitals to sketch out this pi system. We'll begin by drawing two p orbitals side by side to represent the orbitals on these carbon atoms. Now you might remember that we usually represent a p orbital as being shaded on one side and unshaded on the other side. Let's show that for our orbital over here on the left. Now this p orbital itself contains a node right in the center. This is where the wave function changes sign, and there's actually no probability of finding an electron right here. Now, to form our first molecular orbital, this is going to combine with another p orbital. And in this lower energy molecular orbital that we're about to sketch, the shaded sides are going to line up and the unshaded sides will line up like this. When the shaded and unshaded sides line up like this, we say that these orbitals are in phase. So we're showing these as two separate p orbitals because it's easy to sketch it that way. In reality, these orbitals combine and give us a molecular orbital that looks more like this. Now for each atom in our pi system, we're going to have a separate molecular orbital. Let's again draw two p orbitals side by side. Now, instead of combining in phase, as we've shown here, these orbitals will combine in a fashion that is out of phase. So here, I'm going to shade the top of this orbital and the bottom of this orbital. This creates a higher energy orbital with a node right in the center. So there is no probability of finding an electron in this region, and the actual molecular orbital looks something like this. Now we need to populate the MOs with the electrons from the pi system of ethylene. And I'll draw some little lines to show where we can put our electrons potentially. Now we can have a maximum of two electrons in each of these molecular orbitals. And we start by populating the lower energy molecular orbital. So for our two electrons, we only need to put them in the lower energy MO that was all in phase. This orbital containing the electrons is called a bonding molecular orbital. 
and this orbital up here without electrons in it is called an antibonding molecular orbital. There's some other language that we use to describe these molecular orbitals. And so the one with the electrons is going to be the highest orbital containing electrons. So we call this the highest occupied molecular orbital, abbreviated HOMO. Then our lowest energy molecular orbital without electrons is called the LUMO. So this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital here. Now let's look at the allyl cation and anion to see how the HOMO and LUMO may change. The allyl cation is a three carbon system containing an alkene and a carbocation. We can draw resonance for this cation, pushing these electrons over here, which results in a resonance form that looks like this. So this is a three electron system, the double bond has two p orbitals, and then we have an empty p orbital for this carbocation. The allyl anion looks like this. We have our pi system in conjugation with this anion. We can push two arrows to show our resonance form, which can be depicted like this. Let's draw our energy diagram and sketch out our molecular orbitals. We now have three carbon atoms in our pi system, so we're going to expect three molecular orbitals. I'll draw a p orbital on each of these carbon atoms. Notice that I've drawn the p orbital on the middle carbon atom a bit larger than the ones on the end. This is actually how it exists. It's um, a consequence of the mathematics that describes the wave function. It's a little beyond our scope today, but I did want to try to depict it accurately. But now what we need to do is put all of these orbitals in phase as we did for ethylene here. So it doesn't matter if I shade the top or the bottom, but each of these orbitals has to combine in phase. Okay, let's draw our second molecular orbital. Now again, because of the mathematics that describe the wave functions, we want to draw this orbital as symmetrically as possible. And we're going to have one node representing where the wave function changes phase. Because we need to do this with as much symmetry as possible, the node is going to go straight through our central carbon atom. So we don't even draw an orbital on this carbon atom. There's no probability of finding the electron there. And then we shade our molecular orbitals out of phase because they need to switch sign where the node is, as they did here. So in our lowest energy molecular orbital, we had zero nodes. Here we had one. And guess what? In this one, we're going to have two nodes. To separate them with as much symmetry as possible, they'll go right about here and here so we can see that they're not really transecting any of the carbon atoms like we have in this molecular orbital. So we'll draw a p orbital on each of our atoms. Our nodes will be here and here. So I'll shade the top lobe here. In order to show the node, I'll shade the bottom lobe here. And then again, we shade the top lobe here. Now we want to populate these orbitals with the electrons that we have in our pi system. We'll have to do this separately for the cation and the anion. So for our cation, in this pi system, we only have two electrons. We have the carbocation, which is an empty p orbital. We'll put these two electrons in our lowest energy, MO. Now for the allyl anion, this is a different story. We have two four electrons that we need to place into these orbitals. Populate them two at a time, beginning with the orbital of lowest energy. Here's our first pair and our second pair. So for the allyl cation, this is our HOMO and this is our LUMO. Whereas for the allyl anion, this is our HOMO and this is our LUMO. So let's come back to talking about reactions for a second. The reason that reactions can occur is because a highest occupied molecular orbital interacts with a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Something with electrons can interact with a molecular orbital that doesn't contain electrons. And this is how all bonding happens, even if we represent it as an arrow coming from a nucleophile and attacking an electrophile. So to contrast the allyl cation and anion homos, 
In the cation, we have everything in phase. So the phasing on these terminal carbons is unshaded, unshaded. But for the homo of the allyl anion, we have a different pattern. Okay, let's look at one more set of molecular orbitals for butadiene now, and then let's see if we can't make sense of this reactivity pattern. We'll again set up our energy diagram. We now have one, two, three, four carbon atoms in our pi system. We'll set that up looking like this, similar to the way we've drawn butadiene up here. Draw in our p orbitals, and our lowest energy molecular orbital is going to have zero nodes, so we will shade this all in phase. Our next molecular orbital is going to have one node. Because of the mathematics underlying these wave functions, we want the node to be in a position that gives the most symmetry, so a single node will go in between these two central carbon atoms. Remember, this is where the wave function changes sign, so we'll shade the left-hand side in phase, switch the sign here at the node, and shade these two in phase. So for this molecular orbital, we're going to need to have two nodes to place them as symmetrically as possible. Maybe one will be right here and one about here. At any rate, they're between the carbon atoms, not transecting them as we have with our allyl cation and anion. And now we can add our phasing. The highest energy molecular orbital will have three nodes in between each of the carbon atoms. And it looks like this. Let's add our electrons. So we have two, four electrons in our pi system. And so these two orbitals will be populated. So this molecular orbital is our homo and this one our lumo. Now remember I said that we need a homo-lumo interaction for the Diels-Alder reaction or any reaction really to proceed. This homo here for butadiene is higher in energy than the homo for ethylene and it's actually closer to the energy of the LUMO. Now, the lower this energy gap makes the reaction easier. So we'll just say that for now without going into a whole ton of detail here. But this consideration makes butadiene react with its HOMO with the ethylene LUMO. So let's sketch out what that interaction looks like. So we'll draw in our HOMO for butadiene and our LUMO for ethylene. And what we'll notice is these orbitals line up really well. The shaded sides can line up over here, and then the unshaded sides can line up over here. So as these two molecules approach each other, we get favorable in-phase orbital interactions that allows this reaction to proceed. Now let's take a quick peek at our 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. For this to proceed, we'd need the HOMO, of ethylene to interact with a LUMO of ethylene. Like we did for the Diels-Alder, let's just draw our HOMO on top and our LUMO below. Notice on this side of our system, the orbital overlap is good. However, this side of the molecular orbital is out of phase. We can't have an interaction over here because the orbitals don't line up. And so this two plus two cycloaddition does not proceed under thermal conditions. However, we can get this reaction to go by using photochemical conditions. Photochemical conditions excite electrons to a, the next orbital, and this will create a new HOMO. This is actually a reaction that can cause skin cancer. When the sun hits your skin, it can cause these 2 plus 2 cycloadditions to form these thymine dimers. So this does happen, but cannot happen under thermal conditions. Well, I hope you learned something from this lesson. I hope this helped you to sketch molecular orbitals, and I hope you join me again to learn some more chemistry in the future. Please subscribe and click that notification bell, and I'll see you soon.